As even a casual follower of the National Hockey League, advanced statistics are a concept which you will have heard mentioned in commentary, the media, or in discussions online. Even if you belong to the traditional belief that you can only judge talent by your own eyes, watching all 1,271 games in an NHL season is just out of the question. So fans and sportcasters alike have long searched for ways to analyse and predict hockey performance using numbers. I'm Decoding Hockey, and today I'm going to ask the question, are advanced statistics any good at predicting future scoring outcomes? You will have heard of hits, blocks, shots, goals, and plus minus. But what about Corsi, Fenwick, or expected goals? In this video, I'm going to focus on a few key metrics. We'll dig deeper into why people might want to use these statistics, and hopefully realise that there are lots of opinions on how best to measure the performance of players and of teams. Standard statistics work on direct observations of a game. A shot, a goal, and a hit are all easy to see and identify. Advanced statistics take these observables and combine them in an attempt to draw more meaningful conclusions from events on the ice. Firstly, let's take a look at Corsi. Corsi is a metric that works the same way as a plus-minus, except it considers all shot attempts taken by both teams while a player is on the ice, not just goals. Each player can be assigned a Corsi for and a Corsi against, abbreviated as CF and CA. When considering an individual player's Corsi, the stat counts every shot, shot attempt, and block shot taken by all players while that individual is on the ice. A shot is either a puck that results in a goal or is saved by the goalie, a missed shot goes past the net, and a block shot is stopped by a defender on its way to the goal. Each of these events by your own teammates counts in the Corsi 4 column, and each of these events by the opposition in the Corsi against. We can then report a Corsi 4 percentage weighting by weighing the for and against metrics. A Corsi 4 percentage of 50 means that your team had as many scoring chances as your opponent while you were on the ice. A Corsi 4% above 50 means that your team had more shot attempts than your opponent while you were on the ice, and it's a positive. We use the 4 percentage metric as a way to compare between different players. For example, in 2018-19, first lammer Artemi Panarin, who was on the ice at even strength for the Blue Jackets, had 78 goals for, 57 goals against, and 21 plus minus. Whereas while Nick Foligno was on the ice, there were 50 goals scored by the Columbus Blue Jackets, 36 goals scored against, for a plus-minus of 14. On raw plus-minus, Panarin appears the better player. While he was on the ice, his team scored more goals than the opponents. However, when considering that he has greater ice time as a first-liner, then Foligno actually has better relative results by the 4 percentage metric. Here we're looking at a, a new measure goals for percentage, which is the ratio of the number of goals scored by your own team while you're on the ice over all goals that were scored while you're on the ice. A four percentage metric is a, a great way to improve comparability for relative impact while a player's on the ice, but it doesn't correlate to absolute performance. Even though Foligno was more effective with his time, Panarin still produced more goals in the same season. More on these sorts of comparisons later, but I'm now going to introduce a second advanced metric. Fenwick, which sorts to solve a potential limitation in Corsi. Fenwick can be expressed as for or against, and follows the same calculation pattern as Corsi, except that it excludes blocked shots. If certain players or teams strategically block more shots than others, then Corsi may work to deflate their numbers. Let's look at Alex Edler in the 2018-19 season to kind of understand this point. Now, Alex was in the top 10 of the NHL with 166 blocks that season. His season Corsi 4 percentage was down at 47.4%, but his Fenwick 4 percentage was closer to average at 49.6%. If we consider that shocks blocked by him and his team while he was on the ice in his metric as we do in Corsi, then he was a below average defenseman. Fenwick, as a measure, considers that block shots are less risky than those that make it to or past the net, and therefore excludes them. 
If we look at his Fenwick numbers, then Alex is approximately average in terms of his relative chance creation. If a team or a player is known to block shots as a risk aversion tactic, then Fenwick may better represent their performance, as a shot that was blocked by the opposition is nowhere near as dangerous as a shot or a, or a missed shot. A common criticism of both Corsi and Fenwick is that they do not consider the quality of a shot. This is where a third advanced metric called expected goals can be useful. Expected goals also comes in for and against, and rates the quality of shots taken by your own team and those by your opposition. Expected goals weighs each unblocked shots for a broad number of factors, including the distance and the angle from the shot to the goal crease, with closer and straighter shots being better. Research from Krzyzewski on the 2009-10 season was able to mock up this map, which shows the probability of scoring a goal when shooting from each location as predicted by his model. Other factors considered in the model include proximity to a previous shot, with faster rebounds and those involving more angle change being better chances to score, and the type of shot, whether it was a slap shot, snap shot, wrist shot, a tip in, or a backhand. Finally, the game state, whether or not you're in the lead or trailing, and the rink that you were playing at were all taken into account. The relative likelihood of a goal coming from each of these combinations of events is determined by looking at the outcomes of these situations in the past, and these expectation models are produced by individuals on the internet attempting to fit their model to large data sets by linear regression. We can combine all of these factors to give a metric which attempts to apply a quality filter to Fenwick. A shot from close and right in front counts as more of a positive than one that was taken from wide at the point. Players that allow more shots but ones that come from the edge rate more highly than defenders that allow less shots but that are higher quality like breakaways. Overall, this sort of modelling is an imperfect approach, as we're trying to fit an equation to past events. The unpredictability of the sport of hockey means that in some cases, these models are no better at predicting outcomes than luck. In an attempt to actually quantify the predictive ability of statistics, I'm now going to compare a few metrics in terms of their ability to foreshadow the performance of players. We're going to look at the 2019-20 season and try to determine which advanced statistic is worth following the closest. We're going to look at goals for percentage as a measure of pass success. And by using this statistic, we could potentially try to predict who will score more goals in the future by looking at how people have scored goals in the past. This is a method that uses basic statistics as an attempt to predict the future. As a comparison, we're going to look at Corsi, Fenwick and expected goals metrics, which are described by their ability to determine who drives the play. Corsi shown here, but which can be replaced by Fenwick or expected goals, was designed to be a better predictor of future scoring by suggesting that players and teams that generate more chances, that put more pucks or better pucks on the net, will in the long run generate more goals. For this analysis, we'll look at goals for percentage as our measure of reality, what actual goals were scored, and Corsi, Fenwick, and expected goals for percentage as our combative prediction methods. To constrain our model, we're only going to look at players who played in 25 or more games before the 12th of December as our first data set, and that also played 25 or more games between the 12th of December and the trade deadline on the 24th of February as our second data set. This period of time was chosen to avoid effects due to injury and unrepresentative statistics from extraneous low playing time, making sure that we've got players that played a large amount of games in both of these periods. And we remove the effects of playing on different teams by discounting any player that was traded during the periods of interest. To make this explanation a little bit clearer, let's follow Minnesota Wild player Ryan Suter. We can see his goals for, Corsi for, Fenwick for, and expected goals for percentage after his first set of 25 or more games. At this point in time, we can make an assessment as to whether each predictive stat is higher than, lower than, or equal than the goals for percentage. This is taken to correspond to a prediction as to whether the goals for percentage will increase, decrease, or remain constant over the next two and a half month period. For our purposes, we'll say that a prediction is constant if it's within 1% of the goals for percentage value. Taking each stance turn, we can see that Ryan has a goals for percentage of 48.39% over the first set of games. Now this was a little below average. Over this period, his Corsi 4% was 48.19, 
This is within 1%, so it suggests that his goals for will stay roughly the same over the next period. His Fenwick 4 percentage of 46.8 suggests a declination. The opposition had more scoring chances than his team while he was on the ice, so we would expect the goals for percentage to get lower. Conversely, his expected goals for percentage of 51.63 through the first set of games suggests that he'll see an improvement. While the opposition had more chances, they were of a lower quality than those taken by his team. Now we have three predictions. We'll look at the goals for percentage at the end of the second period to see how these predictions pan out. Ryan had a goals for percentage of only 46 in the second set, which is a decline on his performance in the first set. This outcome will be compared to each prediction, and we'll record if the prediction was correct or incorrect. We can see that Corsi, which predicted a constant performance, was incorrect. Fenwick correctly predicted a decline in performance, and expected goals was incorrect. By performing this sort of analysis for all 347 eligible players, we can conclude which prediction method is the most accurate. It's a crude approach and a relatively small data set, but it provides a broad descriptor of the relevance of each statistic. Overall, Corsi was successful in predicting the improvement or decline of 64.6% of players. Fenwick was successful 64.8% of the time and expected goals only 63.1. The numbers are close, but Fenwick is seen to be the preferred metric in this simple test. So if you only want to pay attention to one, then Fenwick might be the stat to look into. The weaker performance of expected goals here may suggest that the employed model of determining shot value may not fully represent the reality of the shots taken in the 2019-20 season. Comparing between these three metrics is well and good, but is getting it right only two-thirds of the time better than just using the basic statistics? To see if it's worth the effort in tracking these advanced metrics, we can compare performance using goals for percentage alone. Using the same set of players, goals for percentage was normalized and a standard deviation calculated. Now we can consider that if a player had a goals for percentage in the second set of games that fell within one standard deviation of their performance in the first, that the goal for percentage from the first half was a good metric to predict second half performance. They performed relatively the same throughout the entire season. Analysis of this reveals that only 34.6% of players had performance in the second set of games which fell within one standard deviation of theirs in the first. If we had to rely on a statistic to predict the future, then the odds of this basic statistic are less favourable than the advanced. If we even expand our range to within two standard deviations, the predictability only increases to 59%. We can see that the advanced metrics performed better than our simple statistic chosen here, and we can conclude that the approach of using shot attempts and of generating scoring chances to predict the future does seem more accurate than just looking at what goals have been scored previously. Now, these advanced metrics are designed to compare players based on their relative opportunity as to how much of a contribution they make. However, in the realm of fantasy hockey, rule production is king. You want a player on your team that's going to score more goals. So a player with a better advanced metric but less ice time might not generate as much absolute offensive output. One potential approach is to use advanced metrics to compare similar players. Say you're tossing up between three third liners. Using the Fenwick 4 percentage may help you find your next key piece, who underperformed in the first half of the season and that other players are less likely to add to their teams. Do you use advanced statistics in your own analysis of the NHL? Do you have any insights as to how advanced statistics have improved your watching experience? Please leave a comment below and let me know your thoughts.